This video will guide you through the most common REST API interview questions and their answers. Whether you are a beginner or an experienced professional, this collection aims to clarify key concepts and challenges. The top 25 questions presented here have been curated from various sources and are frequently asked in technical interviews. The comprehensive answers included will not only prepare you for your upcoming interviews but also strengthen your knowledge about REST APIs. 1. What is a REST API? A REST API, Representational State Transfer Application Programming Interface, is a set of rules and conventions for building and interacting with web services. It uses HTTP requests to access and manipulate data. The data that is sent and received is often in the form of JSON, JavaScript object notation. The REST architectural style is stateless, meaning that each request from the client to the server must contain all the information necessary to understand and process the request. This makes REST APIs simple and easy to use, and they can be designed to be highly scalable and stateless for easier handling of requests. The primary advantage of REST APIs is that they provide a standard way for clients to communicate with servers. This simplifies the process of building web services and allows for a high level of interoperability. Thanks to their stateless nature, REST APIs can handle a large number of requests simultaneously, making them ideal for scalable web services. However, like any software design pattern, REST APIs are not a silver bullet and may not be the best choice for every situation. For example, they may not be suitable for real-time applications that require constant data updates, as they are designed for sporadic data exchange. 2. What are the main characteristics of RESTful APIs? RESTful APIs display several primary characteristics that distinguish them from other types of APIs. Here are four main characteristics. Stateless. Each request from a client to a server must contain all of the information needed to understand and process the request. Client server. The client server architecture enables the client and server to evolve independently without any dependency on each other. Cacheable. REST APIs can be cacheable. This means that the server can indicate to the client that its response can be cached, thus improving performance. Uniform interface. REST APIs have a uniform interface, which simplifies the architecture and increases its visibility. The RESTful API's main characteristics contribute significantly to its flexibility and ease of use. The stateless nature of RESTful APIs ensures that the server does an overall knowledge of the client's state, providing greater scalability potential. The client-server architecture allows both components to be developed independently, promoting separation of concerns. The cacheability of RESTful APIs can lead to improved performance, reducing the load on the server and enhancing the user experience. Finally, the uniform interface principle simplifies the interaction between the client and server, making the API more predictable and easier to use. 3. What is the difference between REST and SOAP? REST and SOAP are both protocols used for building APIs, but they have different approaches. REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer, is a style of architecture that is often used in web services development. It uses standard HTTP methods and is considered more flexible and efficient than SOAP. SOAP, on the other hand, stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. It is a protocol that allows for the exchange of structured information in the implementation of web services using XML SOAP can be used over any protocol such as HTTP, SMTP or even FTP, and is not limited to just HTTP like REST. While REST APIs are stateless, meaning they do not store any information about the client between requests, SOAP APIs are stateful and can store information between requests. This can make SOAP APIs more complex to build and maintain compared to REST APIs. 4. What HTTP methods are commonly used in REST APIs? HTTP methods, often referred to as HTTP verbs, indicate the desired action to be performed on a specified resource. In REST APIs, the most commonly used HTTP methods include GET retrieves data from a server. It's a read-only operation and does not change the state of the resource. Post. Sends data to a server to create a new resource. It's not idempotent, meaning that making the same call multiple times may result in different outcomes. Put. Updates an existing resource or creates a new one if it doesn't exist. It's idempotent, so making the same call multiple times will always result in the same outcome. Delete. Removes a resource from a server. Patch. Applies partial modifications to a resource on a server. HTTP methods play a crucial role in REST APIs. They define the type of operation we want to perform on a given resource. For instance, if we want to retrieve data from a server, we would use the GET method. For updating existing data or creating new data, we would use PUT or POST methods respectively. In case we need to delete data, we would use the DELETE method. Lastly, for partial updates, the PATCH method comes in handy. Note that these methods should be used responsibly to maintain the integrity of the data and avoid unwanted results. 5. How do you handle different HTTP status codes in your API? In handling different HTTP status codes in my API, 
it's essential to adhere to standard HTTP status code conventions. When a request is successful, a 2xx status code is returned. If there is client error, such as a badly formed request or unauthorized access, a 4xx status code is returned. Server errors are indicated by a 5xx status code. It's crucial to handle these status codes in a way that provides meaningful feedback to the client. For example, if a 404 status code is returned, it's best to provide an error message indicating that the requested resource was not found. This allows the client to understand what went wrong and how to fix it. In addition to standard status codes, custom status codes can be used to provide more specific error information. However, it's important to be careful with this approach, as it can potentially confuse clients if not implemented correctly. It's generally best to stick with standard status codes whenever possible and use custom codes sparingly and with clear documentation. 6. What is the purpose of the options method in REST? The options method in REST APIs serves a special role. It is used to describe the communication options available for the target resource. When a client sends an options request to a server, the server sends back a response that includes the HTTP methods the server supports for the specified URL. This can be very useful for allowing the client to understand the capabilities of the server, especially in terms of its support for various HTTP methods like GET, POST, PUT, DELETE, etc. The options method can also return other useful information, such as whether the resource supports CORS, cross-origin resource sharing. It can be seen as a way for the client to ask the server about its capabilities, thus aiding in ensuring that the client and server can communicate effectively. 7. How do you define resources in a REST API? Resources are key components in REST APIs and they are defined as any object, data, or service that can be accessed by the client. They are represented by URLs and can be a single entity or a collection. To define a resource in a REST API, you would specify its URL, which generally includes the name of the resource. For example, if you have a user resource, the URL might be users. If you want to access a specific user, you might add the user's ID to the URL, like so, users, 123. Each different URL represents a different resource within the API. In REST API, defining resources depends on the specific requirements of the application. Resources can be defined as objects that need to be manipulated or queried, such as users, posts, or products in an e-commerce application. Each resource can be identified by a unique URI, Uniform Resource Identifier, which serves as the address for that resource. It's also possible to define nested resources, where one resource is a part of another. For instance, if you want to define a resource for the comments of a specific post, the URI could be structured as posts, one, comments, where one is the ID of the post. It's crucial to create intuitive and predictable URIs to make the API easy to use for developers. 8. What are the best practices for designing resource URIs? The best practices for creating resource URIs in a REST API include being consistent, using nouns instead of verbs, and utilizing HTTP methods for actions. It's crucial to keep URIs as simple as possible, avoiding unnecessary complexity or ambiguity. Using plural nouns can make your URIs more intuitive and easier to read. For instance, use users instead of user. Your URIs should also be easy to understand, avoiding cryptic abbreviations or codes that may confuse users. Including version numbers in your URIs can be beneficial, allowing you to introduce changes without breaking existing client integrations. Lastly, using query parameters to further filter collections can bring more flexibility to your API when designing resource URIs. It's important to stick to conventions that make the API intuitive and easy to use. Consistency in the use of nouns and verbs and using HTTP methods for actions can significantly improve usability. Simplicity is key. The URIs should not be overly complicated or ambiguous. Plural nouns often make the API more intuitive and easier to navigate, for example, users instead of user. Avoiding cryptic abbreviations or codes that could confuse users is also recommended. Including version numbers in URIs can help manage changes and prevent disruptions to existing client integrations. Lastly, using query parameters to filter collections offers more flexibility and control to the user. 9. How would you handle versioning in a REST API? Using versioning in REST APIs is a crucial strategy for maintaining service continuity and avoiding disruption to the client. One approach is to include the API version in the URL, but this tends to be less RESTful. A more appropriate way is to use the content negotiation concept and include the version in the header of the HTTP request. This method, also known as media type versioning, allows clients to specify the version they support, and the server can respond with the appropriate version. It provides a cleaner separation between the resource and its representation which is a fundamental concept of RESTful architecture. Another approach is the use of custom request headers, where the version number is included in a custom header rather than in the HTTP header or URL. This approach allows for greater flexibility, 
but the downside is that it can potentially lead to confusion or misuse due to its non-standard nature. 10. What data formats are typically used in REST APIs? REST APIs typically use JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, as the data format for communication. JSON is a lightweight, text-based, language-independent format that's easy to read and write. It is also easy for machines to parse and generate, making it a popular choice for APIs. REST APIs can also support XML, extensible markup language, but JSON is preferred due to its simplicity and ease of use. Sometimes, REST APIs can support other data formats like HTML, text, CSV, and others depending on the specific requirements of the API in a REST API, JSON, JavaScript object notation, and XML, extensible markup language, are the most commonly used data formats. JSON, being a lightweight, text-based, and language-independent data format, is usually the preferred choice. This is due to its ease of reading and writing, as well as its simplicity for machines to parse and generate. While XML is also used, it's relatively more complex than JSON other data formats such as HTML, text, CSV can also be supported by REST APIs, depending on the specific needs of the API. 11. How do you handle data serialization and deserialization in your API? In handling data serialization and deserialization within APIs, proper and efficient management is important to ensure data security. When data gets serialized, it gets converted into a format that can be stored and retrieved easily. JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, and XML, Extensible Markup Language, are common formats for this purpose. On the other hand, deserialization is the process of converting serialized data back into its original format. It's a critical process as it allows the system to use the data in its original form. Both processes play a key role in data exchange between client and server. It is important to have proper mechanisms in place to handle these processes to prevent errors, maintain data integrity, and ensure good performance of the API. One way to manage data serialization and deserialization effectively is by using middleware. Middleware can seamlessly handle the conversion of data formats, making the process more efficient. It is also important to handle exceptions during these processes, as errors can lead to data corruption. My approach to handling data serialization and deserialization within an API is the use of standard libraries provided by the programming language or the framework I'm using. This not only reduces the potential for errors, but also allows for a more efficient development process. For instance, if I'm using Python, I can utilize its JSON library or Django REST framework serializer if I'm developing a Django application. These tools can conveniently handle the conversion of data to and from JSON format. However, it's not just about converting data. Ensuring data integrity is equally crucial. Therefore, appropriate validation checks are incorporated during the deserialization process to verify if the data is in the expected format and contains the required fields. Exception handling is also implemented to manage any errors that may arise during these processes. This way, I ensure the API's reliability and robustness. 12. What are some common authentication methods for REST APIs? REST APIs use a variety of authentication methods to verify the identity of users and ensure the security of data. One common method is basic authentication, where the client sends a username and password with each request. This method is simple, but not very secure, as the credentials are sent in plain text. Another common method is token-based authentication. In this method, the client sends a token, rather than a username and password, with each request. The token is generated by the server and is unique to each user. This method is more secure than basic authentication, as the token can be revoked by the server at any time. OAuth is another popular authentication method for REST APIs. It allows users to authenticate with the API using their credentials from a third-party service, such as Google or Facebook. This method is very secure and provides a good user experience, as users don't need to remember a separate username and password for the API. Other methods include digest authentication, which is similar to basic authentication but with added security, and API keys, which are unique identifiers that are used to authenticate a user or application. There are other methods as well, and the choice of method depends on the specific requirements of the API and its users. 13. How do you ensure the security of a REST API? In securing a REST API, there are several methods that can be implemented. First, you can use HTTPS to encrypt all communications between the client and the server. This ensures that sensitive data, such as user credentials, are not exposed in plain text. Second, you can implement authentication and authorization to control access to the API. For example, you can use tokens or API keys that are only issued to authorized users. Tokens are typically generated after a successful login and are used to authenticate subsequent requests. Third, you can add validation to the API to prevent common attacks, such as SQL injection or cross-site scripting. This involves validating all input data, whether it is coming from a user, a file, or another API. Lastly, 
keeping your API and its dependencies up to date can help protect against known vulnerabilities that might have been patched in later versions. 14. How do you handle errors in a REST API? In handling errors in a REST API, effective communication of the problem to the client is crucial. When an error occurs, it is essential to return an appropriate HTTP status code along with a clear and concise message describing the problem. This aids the client in understanding what went wrong and how to fix it. A common practice is to use standard HTTP status codes for errors. For instance, 404 not found, for missing resources, 400 bad request, for a malformed request, 500 internal server error, for server side issues, and so on. In addition to the status code, providing a detailed error message in the response body can be helpful. This message can include specific details about what part of the request was problematic. Also, it can be beneficial to have a logging system on the server side to record errors. This can help in debugging and resolving issues in a shorter time frame. 15. What is the importance of providing a consistent error response format? In the world of REST APIs, providing a consistent error response format is crucial. It improves the user experience by providing clear and understandable messages about what went wrong. This consistency allows the client, whether it's a user or another service, to handle errors more effectively and efficiently. Not only does it make debugging easier, but it also makes your API more predictable and easier to use. It also aids in the transparency of the process, as the client can understand what went wrong and possibly how to fix or avoid it in the future. When designing your API, it's important to define what your error responses will look like and stick to that format. This could include information such as an error code, a brief description of the error, and perhaps details about where the error occurred. By doing this, you'll make your API more user-friendly and robust. 16. How can you improve performance of REST API? Enhancing the performance of a REST API involves several strategies. Caching is perhaps one of the essential techniques. By storing frequently accessed data in cache, you reduce the need for repeated database queries, speeding up response times. Compression also plays a significant role. By compressing the data sent via API, bandwidth use reduces, and data transmission becomes faster. Using HTTP, too, can also increase performance as it was designed to decrease latency and allow for multiple concurrent requests. Additionally, reducing the amount of data sent to clients by implementing a system for clients to specify exactly what data they need can also help improve performance. Finally, the use of proper indexing in your database can drastically speed up data retrieval times. 17. What is pagination, and why is it important in REST APIs? Pagination is a technique that divides the data into multiple pages and fetches only a data subset from the server. It's crucial in REST APIs for two reasons. Firstly, it enhances the user experience by simplifying data exploration and navigation. Secondly, it optimizes server resources by reducing the amount of data sent in one go, thereby increasing performance and speed. For instance, if an API returns a list of 10,000 records, it's inefficient to send them all at once. It would lead to slow response times and high server loads. With pagination, you can return a portion of those results, e.g., the first 100 records, and provide the user with the option to request additional data as needed. This approach results in quicker response times and a more efficient use of server resources. It also makes it easier for the client to digest and display the data. 18. What tools do you use for testing REST APIs? For testing REST APIs, one popular tool that I use is Postman. It allows for sending HTTP requests, managing and storing different versions of requests, and even scripting tests. Another useful tool is Swagger, which not only provides testing capabilities but also allows for designing, building, and documenting APIs. For unit testing, I prefer using frameworks like Mocha or Jest in combination with libraries like Chai for assertions. When it comes to performance testing, tools like Apache JMeter or Gatling prove to be very useful. These tools make load testing possible by simulating multiple simultaneous users hitting the API endpoints. On the other hand, there are also tools for automated testing like Selenium or Cucumber. They can be integrated into the CI, CD pipeline for regular checks every time the codebase is updated. Lastly, security testing is equally important for which I use tools like OWASPZAP or Burp Suite. These tools help identify vulnerabilities and ensure the robustness of the API. 19. How important is documentation for a REST API? Documentation is crucial for a REST API. It serves as a guide for developers who are using the API, providing crucial information about how to use it effectively. Good documentation can significantly reduce the amount of time it takes for a developer to understand and start using an API, which in turn reduces the overall development time. It also minimizes potential miscommunication or misunderstanding about how the API should be used. Good documentation should include details about the API's endpoints, the expected request and response formats, any potential error messages, and examples of how to use the API. Without detailed and accurate documentation, developers may struggle to understand how to use the API and may even use it incorrectly leading to bugs and other issues. 
Therefore, while it may be tempting to neglect documentation in favor of other aspects of API development, it should not be overlooked. 20. Can you describe a challenge you faced while developing a REST API and how you overcame it? While developing a REST API, I encountered an issue where the API was not returning the expected results. I found that the issue was due to the incorrect mapping of the URI to the corresponding resource. The API was unable to find the resource because the URI was not correctly mapped it. To solve this issue, I revisited the API design and properly mapped the URIS to the corresponding resources. I also ensured to follow best practices for designing resource URIS to avoid such problems in the future. I carried out rigorous testing, using various tools, to ensure that the API was working as expected. This experience taught me the importance of meticulous API design and rigorous testing. It also reinforced the value of adhering to best practices when developing APIs. 21. How do you monitor the performance and usage of your REST API? Monitoring the performance and usage of your REST API is crucial to ensure its efficient operation. This can be achieved through various methods. One such approach is to employ Application Performance Management, APM, tools. These tools provide real-time monitoring and can alert you to any performance issues. They can also provide detailed reports on API usage. Another technique is to use logging effectively. This involves keeping track of all the requests made to your API, the response time, and any errors that occurred. This data can be used for analysis and to identify any trends that may be affecting the performance. In addition, you can use rate limiting to control the number of requests a client can make to your API within a certain time frame. This can prevent overuse and abuse of your API, thereby ensuring its availability and performance. Remember, monitoring and optimizing your API's performance should be an ongoing process, not a one-time task. I use a variety of tools and techniques to monitor the performance and usage of my REST API I keep track of key metrics, such as response time, error rate, and throughput, using both built-in tools and third-party solutions. I also use logging to record detailed information about each API request and response. This data can then be analyzed to identify any issues or trends. I also make use of rate limiting to prevent abuse and ensure fair usage of the API. If I notice that the API is being overused or abused, I can adjust the rate limits accordingly. Additionally, I perform regular performance testing to ensure that the API can handle high loads and respond quickly to requests. This helps me to identify any potential bottlenecks and make necessary optimizations. Finally, I use alerting systems to notify me of any significant changes in the API's performance or usage. This allows me to respond quickly to any potential issues and maintain the quality of the API. 22. What is HATEOAS, and how does it relate to REST? HATEOAS, an acronym for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State, is an essential aspect of RESTful architecture. It enables a client to interact with a server entirely through hypermedia provided dynamically by application servers. A client enters a RESTful API through a simple fixed URL All future actions the client may take are discovered within resource representations, via hyperlinks embedded within the representation. This reduces the coupling between the client and server, making the API more resilient and flexible to changes in its design. For example, if an API's internal structure changes, clients can still operate by following hypermedia links without requiring modifications. 23. How do you implement rate limiting in a REST API? Rate limiting is a strategy used for controlling the number of requests a client can make to a server within a specific time period. This is often essential to prevent overloading the server and to ensure fair usage among multiple clients. Implementing rate limiting in REST API typically involves setting HTTP headers to communicate the limit details to the client. There are various ways to achieve this, one of which includes the use of middleware. Middleware can check the number of requests from a certain client ID during a set time window. If the limit is exceeded, the middleware can then block further requests from the client for a certain period. The limit details can be communicated back to the client via HTTP headers such as X rate limit limit, the maximum number of requests allowed, X rate limit remaining, number of requests left for the time window, and X rate limit reset, when the rate limit will be reset. Another approach would be to use a third party service like Cloudflare or Akamai, which provide built in rate limiting features. While these services may bring additional costs, they can provide a more robust and scalable solution, especially for larger applications. Remember, it is key to strike a balance between ensuring server stability and providing a good user experience. Overly restrictive rate limits can frustrate and drive away users. So, it's crucial to set reasonable limits that accommodate typical usage patterns. 24. What are webhooks, and how do they differ from REST APIs? Webhooks and REST APIs are both integral parts of web development, each serving their unique purposes. Webhooks, also known as HTTP callbacks, are typically used to perform a certain action when a specific event occurs. They are event-driven and allow applications to receive real-time data, making them ideal for triggering certain actions following specific events. On the other hand, REST APIs operate on a request-response mechanism. 
A client sends a request to the server, and the server responds to this request. They are not event-driven and require polling to receive new data. The main difference between the two lies in their operation. While webhooks push data to other applications as it happens, REST APIs need to pull data explicitly. This makes webhooks more efficient for receiving real-time data, while REST APIs are more versatile for sending and retrieving data as needed. 25. What trends do you see in the future of REST APIs? The future of REST APIs seems to be heading towards more comprehensive and efficient data handling. As technology evolves, so does the need for more effective ways of managing and transferring data. One trend is the increasing use of GraphQL, which allows clients to specify exactly what data they need, reducing overfetching and underfetch overall. Another trend is the shift towards real-time APIs, which can provide immediate updates and push data to clients as it becomes available. This can help to improve the user experience by providing up-to-date information without the need for manual refreshing. Additionally, there seems to be a push towards more standardization in API design to help ensure consistency and usability. Lastly, security continues to be a focal point, with an emphasis on more robust authentication and authorization methods to protect sensitive data. We have now covered the top 25 REST API interview questions and answers in detail. This comprehensive guide was designed to help you prepare for your upcoming interview and boost your chances of securing that job. We hope you found this content valuable and insightful. If so, please show your support by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. This will keep you updated with our latest content, designed to help you succeed in your tech career. Thank you for watching and best of luck with your interview.